Duncan. Uh, I'm happy so to move. Our next speaker is Duncan Harrison, who's Research Data and Digital Preservation Officer at the University of Sussex, working closely with Adam, uh, as we've heard. And you're going to talk about uh, the web capture workflow that you've got there. So um, Duncan we, looks like he's ready to go. So yeah, take it away. Sorry, just get, yeah, are you seeing, seeing the opening slide? Yeah, okay. it's perfect. Yeah. Yep. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having Adam and I today. And thanks, for Adam, for Adam's presentation, which gives a lot of context to this as well. So I'm going to talk to you about the work we do um, capturing web content um, here at the library. To give a little overview of the sort of activities we do around this, we're talking chiefly bulletins and newsletters. Um, that's the basis and the most of our, of our current workflow and the stuff we capture most regularly. We will, on a more ad hoc basis, capture project specific websites that are managed by the university or library. We might capture sections of our sort of main sussex.ac.uk website at various times for various reasons. But then, kind of adjacent to that kind of capture work, we might also use some of these methods to harvest documents that exist online that are of archival use to us. And maybe as a very separate thing we also do some teaching and advocacy around web archives here chiefly through postgraduate research digital skills um digital skills seminars but also internally among interested staff here at the library so it's nice that we're able to do that um the kinds of people the stakeholders involved in creating and managing this content would be researchers, academics, and departments here at the university. But there's also project leads on temporary funded things. Um, staff here at the library, we have a pretty active library blog, so they're creating content. And then a large amount of it comes from our internal comms team here at the library who manage things like the bulletin and the newsletters. So we're in contact with them. And then that, in terms of our sort of archival strategy for it, that comes through the special collections archivist and myself and Adam on the digital development and systems team. So the big reasons why we've developed this workflow and some of the issues that it sets out to address are that content moves from paper to digital quite frequently and that particularly in the case of our bulletins and newsletters um, we had to come up with a solution as the paper was phased out. Um, projects obviously end and then the websites that are connected to them have no one left to look after them so they need to be preserved as outputs of, of uh, that piece of university activity. Content sometimes simply gets removed or migrated elsewhere for example library blog that we had um, existed for many years in one place that was an internal blog but then we decided to make it public but that meant certain things that uh, existed on it needed to be removed. Um, and we took a capture of it before we had done that. Um, and then finally, uh, we, we want to record university rapid response. The immediate thing I think of is COVID. So we want to record what did when that happened. And all of this is to kind of work towards actively preserving the institutional memory of the university and the library. Um, so the way it developed and what we did to kind of start developing this workflow was basically it all it came really and it is always driven by a matter of wanting to increase capacity and always look at how we can do things a little bit better, maybe to a little bit of a higher standard than we already are, um, particularly since my post came about and this work is able to be done a bit more regularly. Um, so a lot of research into the methods and standards that inform web archiving has kind of gone into has it gone into this work. And along with that, testing of open source tools, um, a lot of engagement with communities of practice around not only web archives, but digital practice, uh, digital preservation practices in general. Like there's lots and lots to do with all of our workflows that we learn from DPC and events that are hosted by the DPC and beyond. <laughs> Um, and then the really important thing is loads and loads of getting things wrong and failing and having to go back to the drawing board has informed this workflow. And I think it's important to talk about that on a space like this, because it's very easy to think that if you're not doing things perfectly right away, then you're bad at your job. But I think the maybe less discussed reality of these things is that we've all got maybe not that many people doing this work and no one can be an expert in everything and we all have to learn so being given the space to get things wrong and try again is one of the most valuable um, aspects of this job for me and, and informs everything about this workflow 
Um, just like Adam did, I'm going to summarise these tools. It's not really for me to go into the kind of nuts and bolts of how it all works. Um, you can research all of these things later if you want. They're quite well known and common tools. However, you've got three uh, different methods of web capture on the left here, Conifer, Archive Web and WGET. Conifer and Archive Web are manual web capture tools, which essentially let you record a browsing session. Very, very easy to use and have a graphical interface. Whereas WGET is a command line web crawler that we use via an instance of Linux on our Windows machines. Much more complex, but you can do much more with it. Um, everyone will have heard of Google Drive, but that's quite key to one of these workflows where we use it in tandem with a really handy app called Drive to Web, which allows us to publish HTML content hosted in either Google Drive or OneDrive. And whilst it's not a tool in the same way, we'll be making reference over and over again to web archive files or WARCs, um, which is the agreed upon, generally agreed upon standard uh, and output file for this kind of work. And to briefly explain, you can think of it something like a zip folder, a container file, which links together various assets, instructions and bits of metadata that, are, that tell you how the website behaves, looks and operates. And when you use them in tandem with particular bits of software, you can replay them, so to speak, and it replicates your original browsing experience. Um, so we just move on. I begin to sort of talk about these workflows by making reference to our bulletins and newsletters, because that was the main thing that forced us into having to think about it a bit more. Um, they come to us in quite a standard format in an email where it's just, you know, it's images, headlines, summaries of articles, but then links out to dynamic web content. So they come as emails, but they link out to other things on our website and beyond. And it's both of those elements we want to capture. And important to note as well is that on the right hand side, I've got an image that shows you have these time sensitive links that particularly advertise events and so on. And those are not as easy to access if at all accessible once these deadlines have passed. And so it means that we have to be quite quick with our capture. Um, and to go into a bit more about how it developed, it's a bit of a story behind it, which as I've mentioned, it be, we get hard copies, hard paper copies of these newsletters become phased out over time. Internal comms produces archive.sussex.ac.uk, which is created to host these documents. In terms of access, it's a really amazing resource, uh, but it soon becomes clear to us that we need a higher level of archival sort of overview of this because the formats and the timeliness with which they're uploaded are not really suitable for archiving. And that's, that's no knock at all on internal comms. It just demonstrates that they have a very different set of ways of thinking about this content than us. So before I got here, um, the special collections archivist and Adam researched into what to do and indicated that WARC files are the best way to capture this content and they begin using Conifer, which is one of the tools I mentioned previously, to capture. Now, we used to get these mail outs through MailChimp and if you've used that before, you might know that there is a link at the bottom of every email that lets you view that content in a browser. So you have a URL um, that you can point your crawler at and you can capture it and it's nice and easy. Now that's what we did for a while, but internal comms are eventually forced to abandon that platform for various reasons. Um, and they begin to upload them in PDFs to the archive page. Um, so for a short while, we experiment with exporting these things as PDFs, hosting the PDFs online, and then capturing them with tools like Conifer so that we can preserve the element of that object that links out. Um, but there's just, it's too many steps away from the original item. Some of the interfaces we use to do that are not particularly reliable. And they sometimes change the sort of images and the operability of the thing. And so we have to kind of rethink that strategy. We basically want a solution that allows us to host email content as HTML from the minute we get it. And through nothing less than a DPC Connect session on a Friday, which if you don't know is a sort of very, very informal 30 minute session that happens most Fridays with no agenda where people in the field just have a friendly chat about what they're up to. I talk about this and various colleagues in the field tell me what they do for their web capture processes. And it's there that I learn about the tool Drive to Web and the process of publishing via Google Drive. 
Um, I also at the same time revisit archiveweb.page, which I've looked at before. And over time, I realized that in, in combination with this Google Drive and Drive to Web process, it's a much more reliable, uh, user-friendly tool for me. So we abandon Conifer in favor of that process. And also alongside all of this, I've slowly and painfully been learning WGET. Um, and some of the things I would use that tool for, I can do um, to this process as well. And the end result of that is really that since June 2023 last year, we've now got a really good workflow in place that gets carried out a few times a week. And we're able to flexibly apply it to all kinds of different content. And our problem is solved, really. So quick overview of that. Email bulletins arrive. Immediately, I'm able to save it as HTML content. I package those files up into a folder. They are moved through to Google Drive, and then they are pushed through to a URL and published via Drive to Web. I then have that bulletin content available as a URL, which I can look at online through a browser. And using any one of these three tools that I mentioned earlier, I'm able to capture that content. And that's, that's what we do. Um, I just want to make mention here that Web Recorder actually has some really interesting and helpful indexing functions uh, which produce extra metadata which is wrapped up in what is known as a wax file but within that is a WARC file and it all behaves the same uh, and so sometimes it's the case that I can use a combination of these tools and patch it together with web recorder if I want uh, to gain that indexing so in terms of when we have larger projects to do it's some in some ways a simpler uh, process but um, when you get into large websites, you run into problems where there are multiple pages and a much more complex architecture that links them all together. Manually crawling it is entirely possible, but it would be very time consuming and it would basically be prone to error, by which I mean human error. I would struggle to keep tabs of what I've done and, uh, and I'm much more likely to miss things and get them wrong. Um, so what we also might want to do whilst we're capturing or instead of just capturing a work of this of this website, we might want to harvest individual um, assets that are hosted on there, such as PDFs, maybe images, maybe audio files. Um, and so for that, we would want to be looking at using WGET here. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to explain WGET in very much detail, but I can say that there are things you can do in your commands that um, make all of these problems much, much easier to deal with. So you can define the depth of your crawl for, for starters. So you, I, i.e. how many clicks, right? If I've got a website, I can say I want it to click on every link on that page and then every link again and so on and so on. Or I could get it to mirror the whole site. I can restrict to the domain that, that my content is hosted in. So if I say that WGET, I only want you to capture things with the domain sussex.ac.uk, it's not going to link out to external things and basically give me a small version of Google on my hard drive. Yeah, I can restrict the hierarchy of the crawl. So if I'm looking at a kind of subdirectory, i.e. here I've just written sussex.ac.uk example page, I can say I don't want it to go any higher than that which means I don't get top level sort of home pages that I don't need. And then depending on what I'm going to do, I can create or not curate directories for all the files I get, which make them much easier to access. Um, and I can define what will be saved and deleted within that crawl as I go on. Um, the text you see in the middle here is, is what that looks like. We've got, we're, we're pointing wget at this URL. We're saying that we want to mirror the whole website or sort of as an alternative, we could ask it to recursively crawl to three links deep. I've restricted the domains to Sussex and told it I don't want it to go any higher than that in the hierarchy. Page requisites means that it downloads all of the assets needed to re represent the page, uh, like everything that needs to be needs to be there to, to look like a proper website. Um, span hosts means that should there be any content living outside Sussex, so, so let's say we had something hosted on an image hosting website it would retrieve from that other host and convert links means that everything will be converted so that it will work in a static offline version and finally i've said that i want it to output that as a work file and the end result of that interaction between my url and wget is that i get a big folder with all of the assets in there that i can do what i want with and there's a work file in there that i can archive and replay so 
sort of move on quickly now. What we can just a little bit on the storage and cataloging. Adam's given the overall context here. Our files are stored in instances of uh, box, which are managed by the university, um, and staff who need to see that can can. Uh, gain access to it. The catalogue records are updated in Calm each time we do a new crawl. The items are named using a fixed file naming schema that, can, that contains their reference number and the date of publication and capture, which is really good for retrieving and access. We update our checksums every time something new is done and our collections are ingested on a year to year basis. So every time a year passes, I will take each year's um, amount of newsletters and I've been constantly applying checksums to them to make sure they work properly and they will be ingested each time we have a year a year's worth so finish up now talking about the pros and cons I think the workflow is good it's very flexible and there's plenty we can do with it um, they're quite interoperative the different tools we use work more or less in tandem and I know what I have to do to achieve each different thing even if the outcomes are going to be different um, I like that the outputs of our workflow do result in archival, archivally recognized standards. Um, and I like a lot that we're able to train staff and researchers in this. It's really, really rewarding to share that and teach people how they can use it in their own projects. And it helps you learn a lot more about it as well. I think some of the issues, similarly to what Adam talked about, is that we are reliant upon third party tools and services. To some extent, that's true of any kind of digital preservation action that uses tools. But in, in the instance of something like Drive to Web, which is a bit of a labor of love that one very, very nice, generous person has done, we're not able to guarantee that the solution will always be there. And as online content is changing rapidly and all the time, your success is never guaranteed over and over again. It's quite an invisible thing if something changes about a piece of web content and you know something that doesn't work with your tools might be included into a bulletin one day, for example. And then maybe the, at the crux of it all is following process is really easy, but troubleshooting is not, okay? So things work until they don't. And when it's up to you with limited knowledge and self-taught experience in this to troubleshoot some quite comp difficult complex things that can be really difficult to do um, and that's that's something we continually come up against in this process to look towards the future and what we might like to do next I think I would like to continue to engage with the community of practice around this and in so doing keep an eye on new developments and trial new things as they come you never know something might um, improve the workflow as a general push in the library and probably everywhere in our sector, I think that we're looking into how AI and automation can change our workflows and I don't expect the web archiving to be any different. Um, I would like to do more to promote the archives and raise the profile of the collections among students and researchers and continue to develop our teaching offer because that really is a place where you learn what people want to do with this stuff um, and gain a lot more experience in it. Um, so that wraps up my part of this talk. I always like to say that whether or not you ask me any questions here, uh, I'm really always happy to talk about um, the processes sort of one-to-one. -one. Uh, I know that sometimes just being able to ask what seem like really silly questions and say, show me what it looks like is, is how you learn things here. So anyone can write to me at any point if they want some more detailed um, uh, information. And if you've spotted anything glaring that's wrong about what I've done or things I could be doing better, then that's great for me to hear as well. So um, yeah, R write to me anytime, but for now, I'm happy to try and answer your questions as best as I can. Oh, well, thanks, Duncan. That, that was excellent and lots of interesting stuff in there. And you've already uh, raised a, a few questions in the chat, I can see. Um, so we might as well take them in, in the order in which they came in. So the first one was from, from Christopher Werner, who says, um, regarding WGET, uh, can it exclude links to advertisement bots? Can you? I think you're muted, Duncan. So I had to stop sharing there to get my, That's okay. uh, mic, Sorry, to get my I... mic back. <laughs> Hopefully you <laughs> took note of my email if you need it. Can W get exclude links to advertisement bots? I don't know. Uh, that isn't, you can, you can get it to ignore certain things embedded in websites. I don't have much experience with advertising bots, uh, chiefly because a lot of what we capture is internal to Sussex where that stuff doesn't exist. Um, I don't want to give you an uninformed answer to that, but, but what I would say is that there is a lot that can be done with it and an exhaustive 
guide to the different sorts of flags and there's also a mailing list where people talk about um talk about the kinds of things they're trying to do and, and struggling with um so yeah i'm sorry it's not a very satisfactory answer i would like to sort of confidently say you might be able to given how much there is to it that i honestly don't ever use and have not had um cause to use but it's something i wouldn't want to guarantee it i'm, I'm sorry about that that's okay we're all learning so yeah <laughs> uh, maybe maybe someone will, will, will know more and can, can respond in the chat or as you say we can bring it up at a, a future conversation uh the next uh, uh, a couple of questions from ruth mcguire uh, i and i suggest we probably take them in reverse order actually where she sure. ends by saying do you, do you upload the work files to archive them mm -hmm. yes yeah we do that's where we upload everything um i do know that uh when i said Preservica, which we don't use, that, that actually, I think that has an internal WARC replay mechanism. So if anyone is, used, we use Archivum and it's fine. We don't need Archivum to look at what's in the WARCs. And we're perfectly happy with that as a storage solution. But if anyone is using uh, Preservica, I think you can view your WARCs in that. So something to know about. And I see the other question here is about bulletins on the intranet. So they're not on the intranet. Um, they are content that is developed sort of in a closed off area by the internal comms team and they exist in mail outs. And when they want to put them up for kind of public view, they'll bounce them out to a PDF and host it on archive.sussex. Some of the content might be behind the staff wall. So, and that's an important thing I need to mention about when you write to work is so if I sign in with my staff credentials in that work, file that's going to be in there somewhere right you're going to be able to see my credentials um and my password i'm not worried with people knowing that i'm the person that did the crawl but it would it would be true that for now as a closed thing that's completely internal it's fine but if, if that does get to a point where we are publicly issuing those to people i would probably want to go into that file and find every instance of my password and uh, and blank it out basically um yeah, something to think about. I've often recommended to researchers and students that if they want to use it to capture social media, that they maybe use a completely separate account that they're doing just for that work. Okay. Just give people a, a, a chance to think whilst I just throw one at you myself, which is that for your sort of project websites and your sort mm. of the, the kind of university outward facing stuff, yeah. the very public stuff. Yeah. Um, how, and maybe I missed this. Why did you decide to sort of essentially do it yourself and keep it in house rather than kind of effectively either use something like, you know, the, the uh, Internet Archive, the Archive It Service, or, or push the UK Web Archive to sort of record it as part of the kind of national record of given that a lot of these things are publicly funded uh, and then it might save you some grief? No, no. And you're right. And one thing I didn't really have a I didn't really have an appropriate place to slot this into the talk but um, when I mentioned the DPC connect session where I learned about a few of these things someone did direct me to use towards the UK web archive and so some of the work we would have been trying to do um, to capture very large parts of the website we, we found is being done by the UK web archive and we consider that to be a sufficient bit of archiving for some of that very very high level stuff but the reasons for taking the project stuff uh in house is because we uh I, using internet archive accidental interference there but um sorry so that's okay we we do it ourselves because we like to um one is some of it's about having a project to learn with um but we like to be able to kind of create our own copies that are much easier than to share if we need to with researchers so it would be pretty easy to do if i used the internet archive but i wouldn't have quite so much control over the results of that crawl and it would of course then be the case that certain things were publicly available that i might not want to be um, and so doing it ourselves is a nice thing to do even in addition to existing solutions because like where we keep it in box for example makes it very very simple to share with people if we want we can get people to sign various forms that say they won't do terrible things with it and then we can link them directly to it and give them instructions with how to work and so you know I do think that in time a conversation with something like UK Web Archive would be fantastic to have 
but in terms of the speed of the access making mm. our own copies of things and and when you consider that it's kind of an outgrowth of stuff we have to do anyway for other work it, it makes sense to do it mm. okay well thanks very much duncan uh, and adam uh, and i know you've put up your contact details and, and we always say if if people have any uh follow-up questions you're always welcome to send them via the dpc and we can pass them on and people are beating me to the suggestion of a virtual applause for both adam and duncan uh so uh, i'm going to do it myself now if i can click on the right uh, uh icon there we go so thanks again guys